we're getting ready to go into the we're getting ready we're, we're, we're compiling all that data now so we can actually create like a draft version of the platform and that's the conversations that we're having we're going to be going through the raw data uh, we've had somebody already trying to compile all of that for us but we're actually going to as a committee kind of look at more of it too to make sure that uh, one person's not sort of we want more than one perspective, right, of, of the analysis of what we actually hear or what we've heard. Um, and then we're going to create the draft platform. It's going to take a couple more weeks to, to really even get to anything sort of clear about where we're going. Uh, if people are interested in just some of the ideas that we've heard, I do have a list of just some of the stuff that I personally heard from people. Uh, but that's only me. I'm only one. There were, uh, there were actually 12 total different facilitators that were doing the outreach, so, uh, but I'm, so I, of which I was just one, but I have a long list of like six pages of ideas that people suggested to me that I've already recorded. So here is the top new idea that comes to mind. Um, sure, Doug, you say. <laughs> Let me, I just, I'll, go, I'll try to grab a few off of this sheet. Yeah. I'll put my glasses on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> no, I can't see, I can't even see to see my glasses. How do you can find your glasses when you can't yeah. see to see your glasses? Okay, good, you're good. All right. Uh, well, you know, there was a lot of the, the, the kind of stuff that you would expect to see, like um, a lot of support for safe consumption sites. Uh, I think that uh, as a neighborhood, we've already pretty much settled on that, which is a big change from where we were like two, three years ago, right? And it's coming. And it's coming. Um, it tentatively, was July 1st, although now I'm starting to hear that there's that, that may actually not be a hard day. Uh, Oh, people were talking about taking that one step further to creating wet houses or just wet floors in some of the existing shelters. Um, the idea being that some of these folks who are on the street are there because uh, they're intoxicated or they're drinking or they're using and they can't do that in the shelter. Uh, and so they stay on the street. This would be sort of like a place where if, even if you were intoxicated, you could still, they would still allow you in um, even if you're currently using. So. It's been done in other places and with some success. Uh, unlike safe consumption sites, which have never been done in the United States, wet houses are actually do exist in some of the other cities in, in, in the United States. So it's actually not even that new of an idea. It's just not been done in San Francisco. Uh, Robert Sevier, Mr. Corby. Hmm? Mr. Wheelchair, Robert Sevier, the Vietnam vet on the third floor. Yeah. He was pretty much wet all the time. <laughs> there you so go. We had one here. Well, there's there's proof that you know if you if you give somebody a housing even if they're drinking or alcoholic or whatever that, that you have better outcomes. Uh, of course, there's you know one of, some of the common ones. Another common one is the vacancy tax. Everybody's talking about a vacancy tax, vacancy tax, and even Jane Kim is supporting a vacancy tax. So that's been something we heard a lot about. Uh, Jane talk, supports taxes. Yeah, she does. The vacancy tax would tax any vacant unit, um, which really is, is sort of meant to incentivize landlords to not let units sit empty, right? Right now, there's a large portion of our SRO, unit, SRO units that are actually sitting vacant uh, for various reasons, um, sometimes very shady reasons, because one of the things that we've seen is, for example, at the Bristol Hotel, the landlords use very shady sort of tactics to empty all the residents out of the hotel, let it sit empty for two years, then you go in, you do a remodel, and you rent them out at a much higher level, right? Um, and if you wait a few years, uh, those old residents that you pushed out that might have still had a way to come back in, you know, a lot of them won't be a, you won't be able to track them down, or they have moved on, or they've died, or whatever. And, and uh, so it's pretty shady practice, but uh, we were seeing a lot of that. And, and there's actually just a lot of SROs that are sitting empty. And, we don't really have an explanation for that, um, other than there must be some other financial reason. Tax Airbnb, right you know, possibly, and uh, we, there's no record of that, right? There's no way to track that. So another thing is to do a rental registry. We want to go through and, and identify all of the properties and rental properties in San Francisco and have a registry of all of them. Uh, what's for rent? What's vacant? How much it's renting for? Um, that way we can keep people honest, right? And uh, also we can know. We have a better idea of what's actually happening and where you know and what and, and what we need to do. If we got, if you're talking about a law specifically for SROs, that that would, might actually be something that would be doable. Yeah. Uh, Kurt, excuse me, Kurt. Mm -hmm. The Bristol Hotel you were talking about was just in front of the Historic Preservation Commission a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I was there. On, um, uh, 
historic uh, work to be done to restore the uh, historic value of the building, including all the windows, part of the front facade, um, and other areas uh, um, as part of the trying to recapture historic value. Mm -hmm. And the landlord was really brought to task by the by the planning commission. We actually appealed over the windows and brought it before the planning commission so that we could really bring the whole project up, you know, to, to sort of a level where it could actually be we could put it on the public record and talk about it. Because uh, the windows wasn't really, was the only sort of uh, handle. Hand, yeah, I don't know. Hope we had to, to bring it before into a hearing. So. Uh, it wasn't really about the windows, but we used the windows to get there, which is a little shameful, but that's what we did. And uh, we were able to secure um, a guarantee from the landlord that all of those previous tenants that he criminally put out that did file a lawsuit and have won a lawsuit against him, but that he would, they would physically go find all of those people and actually serve them rather than just sending out a letter and saying, oh, well, they never answered, right? So, because some, some of those people are still homeless, you know, and, and stuff, so uh, they are they were now required to go out and, and physically serve all of those people and let them know that they have the, op the, uh, the option to move back in into one of these nicer, newer units, and uh, absolute guarantee that they would come back at exactly the same rent if, when they left, with absolutely no pass-through for any of the costs. So, that, um, that was a, a little victory for us. <laughs> a, a big part of getting low-income housing and maintaining it and keeping it and defending it, bureaucratic roadblocks. That, that's everything that's been done in this neighborhood. LSI convictions are usually based on something that the landlord, mm -hmm. the defense, mm -hmm. something the landlord didn't do right. Yeah. That's not scandalous. Right. I, not I, I, was, I was saying that I actually didn't feel shame, ashamed. I was At actually all. proud of this. <laughs> so I'm proud of my community for no. showing up and getting that done. Uh, so, and, and similarly, we, we kind of brought um, Star City, who I know has been to this group and, well, the previous group, and, and presented before, uh, who are building um, sort of this group housing, kind of SRO group housing model um, in the city. Uh, they had originally promised to never do that with exist, not to take existing SROs like in Bristol or whatever and convert them. Uh, but then, we found that they were considering taking over the Bristol Hotel. They were going to buy the Bristol once it was done. And um, so we stepped in and really kind of pressured them. They've agreed not to do that. And what's more, uh, because of the whole thing, and we showed up planning on in a couple of their hearings, a couple of their other projects, uh, they've suddenly decided that they're willing to sit down with us. We're going to do a public press conference where they're going to step up in front of the cameras and announce that they. Uh, have pulled out of these sort of projects. They're going to promise never to take existing <laughs> SROs and convert them to this new SRO group model. They'll only build in like um, commercial properties or parking lots or whatever. And, and so they won't try to convert any more existing SROs. And they're going to actually try and invite or, or encourage or sort of shame other developers of like minds to uh, <laughs> step up and promise and vow not to do it also. Um, which I think is another great victory for our community because clearly it wasn't in their financial interest to do this, uh, but they, we actually did manage to scare them a little. With the, with they, they, they confessed to us, probably not meaning to, because I think they ran off the mouth, that their, their sort of their threshold with their uh, uh, investors is kind of small. Right? The, the expectation, the, the, the room they have to play with, if they don't stay on their schedule, with all of their building and the permitting in the building, that they're, they're potential, that they have investors that are potentially willing to, are ready to pull out, and it would just, they're kind of on a house of cards, right? And once we found that out, it was like, well, that, thank you for telling me that, right? <laughs> because now I know where to push, right? If I slow down your project, you're at jeopardy. So that really did bring them to the table. Um, having said that, uh, there's a lot, I mean, there's so many, I got the, there's six pages of ideas right here that I learned. And uh, I did send it to David, but um, I wanted to talk to anybody about like some of the other ideas. There's some pretty radical stuff in here too, uh, which I'm a radical, so I kind of like some of it. But uh, you know, there's discussion about using things like using eminent domain to try and take possession of vacant properties to use it for homeless or homeless services, or to turn it into house affordable housing, um, or perhaps even just using in that as a threat to hold over a landlord to make him rent out or lease out his property if it's sitting empty, you know, like just the fear of eminent domain being used might be enough to 
actually affect the same result, right? Because they'd be afraid of losing the property. So I think there's, there's a lot of really radical stuff in there like that, but uh, I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to talk to anybody about it, and I'm always interested, always interested in hearing any other additional ideas on anything from the six categories, which were like uh, uh, community improvements, homeless and houseness, homelessness and housing, uh, health and well-being, uh, community empowerment, um, safety and cleanliness. Is your group looking into uh, the proposed turnover by the Academy Art University and the Academy Art Institute um, of SROs, they took over for student housing that the city's making them turn it back over into um, uh, rental housing. Uh, and you thought about going, making sure that they actually do that and that they, they turn the buildings back into the housing that they destroyed in order to make it student housing. It was 63 or $60 million. So 10 or 12 buildings the yeah. um, city forced the Academy Art University to do, and there's eight or nine buildings the, um, Academy, the um, Art Institute has to do. And it's not just in the, in the Tenderloin, it's District 6, it's District 3, that are, both have uh, all these buildings in them. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's something we need to stay on top of. Yeah, I think so um, too. To I make sure that this happens and we get those thousands of units back into the rental market. Which would be, a, which would be awesome because that really was a problem. A good comment on the Academy of Art, I've been correcting them too. They sort of have, they have a 40 year history of being a stock law, of ignoring city regulations, of not of building without permit, of not filing, and fined <coughs> repeatedly by the city and ignoring and still behaving badly. We're the, they're a really awful landlord. Yeah. And we, we do need to stay on top of them because they will continue to act badly and uh, unless held to task. So thank you for bringing Yes, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, I will definitely put it on the list. Uh, yeah, this, I'll try to be brief. There were, there were supposed to be four tour hotels that wanted to go all tourist, but each of these hotels had a certain amount of permanent residents. You know, like, you know, like a lower floors or something. And they got into agreement with uh, one of these people that was going to build, uh, they going to build uh, those mini house, mini apartments or something. And they yeah, you're talking, you're talking about the hotels <coughs> over around Union Square. Yeah. That um, put together and are building the two buildings over by the YMCA with the old YMCA. Yeah, park housing lot. guys over there. Um, I heard that, that one fell through. Not, the well, residential yeah. housing isn't built yet, and um, I have I haven't been able to find out if they've converted the uh, uh, hotel that they were taking over into tourists. I haven't been able to find anything out. Well, yet. well, I, they haven't yet because the person I know that's living there that would be affected by that hasn't been informed uh, that, that, so that they've good. got a nice place to her, for her to move to. <laughs> yeah, so that project was delayed, and we, the last I heard about the conversion was that, that um, it wasn't going to happen, at least as it stands right now, uh, but that is an ongoing fight. So that, that, that whole matter is not settled up, so I don't want to like give yeah. some sense of false security. There are another half a dozen projects in the works to do similar group housing projects. Yeah, it's the new trend, uh, and it's a really ugly model. Um, I, I think that it has its place. I do believe that we need to build some of this kind of medium income housing for this particular group. We just gotta make sure it's done in a thoughtful and intelligent way, that it doesn't lead to displacement of folks who are already housed by converting our, our very fragile SRO housing, which can't be replaced, right? If we, once we lose the SRO housing, there's no way economically to build new SRO housing, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's, so, and that's the last level of housing for people who are really at risk of becoming homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a really important fight. And be something to put in a Tenderloin 2030 plan, that should be, let's see some new SRO housing. Yeah, I see you know, one project, a demonstration project. It would be great if we could figure out a way to do it. Yeah. I honestly, I don't know you economically know, how to make that happen know, yet, but there's got to be a way to do it. Even the plan doesn't mean you're going to achieve it. Right, I like it. I like the idea. Yeah. So, new SRO, uh, I would David, love to figure that out. David here, group housing is a form of SRO. Yeah. So, 
it's just a higher level. Yeah. Dead net, and if Star City, which wants to build more group housing, mm -hmm. gets their way, there will be uh, these sort of new, new, new SROs. SROs. Yeah. New and in the long run, run, that might actually be very beneficial even to our lowest income residents because that may become the future's right. lower lower well, level of social watch housing. Right? Watch for who takes over the community kitchen. <laughs> I, I want to pick back on something on this. It has to do with this, but it's got kind of picking up going with everybody in the room. Okay. District six planners, community planners. Last meeting, we approved a project that had 12 and a half percent affordable. It was a four market rate housing on Van Ness. 12 and a half percent, that's it. It was mostly larger units. And we just, I just gave you a spiel about how we really have to look at smaller units. And when we have smaller units, it's more likely to be a lower income population that moves into smaller units, which is less likely to cause social and cultural displacement in the neighborhood. It, that project really had nothing for us. We, we don't have to approve every project that we present, we're doing them a favor if we don't oppose their project. So I'd like yeah. to, I'm mm -hmm. hoping as a, you know, as a general rule, we, we can look at projects like the TDC people brought in here, which is, they were all 100% affordable. 100%, and you know, support that. I mean, even if somebody can come in here with 50% affordable, or if somebody comes in with small units, you know, studios and efficiencies, that's what we need. Thank you very much for hearing me out. You know, that's something we could put in the plan, too, smaller units. Yeah, I wrote it down. I did. Okay, I won't run out of battery power now. Um, last item on the agenda is community issues. And as usual, unloaded. Thank you. Uh, I've got a project receiving environmental review for the flower mart. I may have brought this up last month, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of the central market, central SOMA plan, and I got a copy of uh, the comments uh, and response to comments book on the central market plan, and it's 847 pages. Oh. Um, and I have called, I, last night I sent an email to planning to get a copy of the final EIR for Central SOMA plan. Uh, two issues uh, that the TDC did not bring up tonight. Uh, there are two projects in that require Central SOMA plan to uh, exist in order to build. Uh, both projects involve off-site uh, housing for affordability and TDC has partnered with both developers to build that off-site housing as 100% affordable housing. Um, the downside to that is one plan is 964 market rate units in, in a two tower building that looks like a sideways version of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And um, the other one is a 1,240 unit project, which will be all high-end housing, a uh, block and a half away from the 900 unit housing project, uh, both in South of Market. Uh, yes, we get some fairly good low-income housing, but um, personally, five, five I'd rather not five see the high project. Now this, this this is still still in the thought pattern because Central Solar Plan isn't final yet. Okay. This, you know this big thing on the corner of it, but that's the inclusion of part by that. That's uh, the thing. Uh, because they mentioned that they got eighteen million dollars. The eighteen million dollars came from the developers of the um, Crocker. The, the Chronicle project, which is a 400 uh, foot uh, high end condo building. That's five in. On fifth in Mission. That's called five in. Five in. Um, and uh, so that project, the developers of that project put $18 million into the corner project as their, um, as their offset. Thank you. Yeah. I'll piggyback on that. 
I think we have to really keep an eye on TNBC and I, I don't know exactly where to draw the line, but at some